Hello, I'm Glenn Elmers, the Salvatore Research Fellow at the Claremont Institute, uh, and I'm joined by a very special guest to talk about uh, American politics. And I think we're, prob we're probably going to touch on a little bit of foreign policy and perhaps mention a little bit about uh, this new book that I've offered, uh, authored, uh, Plato Foucault, The Narrow Passage, Plato Foucault and the Possibility of Political Philosophy. Peter Berkowitz, my guest uh, today, uh, is the Tad and Diane Taub uh, Fellow at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. He's had a very distinguished career, including senior positions at the State Department. He is the author of many, author or editor of many books in political philosophy and American government, foreign policy and strategy. Uh, and I'm very delighted to have him here. Peter, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be with you. Uh, Glenn, look forward to the conversation. Great. So uh, as we're doing this, it's a little over a month since the Hamas attack on Israel and the war that broke out there. And it reminds us uh, of some of the uh, perennial hard truths of politics, which is one of the themes that comes up in my book, in particular, this question of tribalism, the question of uh, uh, whatever happened to the promise of the Enlightenment for universal reason and perpetual peace. Uh, I wonder, since this is certainly uh, one of your specialties, uh, foreign policy and, and strategy, uh, do you have any sort of philosophical, theoretical thoughts uh, on what's going on in the Middle East that uh, occur to you right now? Um, yes, I suppose I do. Um, but I want to um, uh, distinguish between my thoughts about um, what drives the, the Hamas jihadists and um, what we can learn from the reaction on campuses to the monsters. So um, uh, first, we need to understand that the Hamas jihadists are uh, driven by a radical interpretation of, of Islam. And we know from a number of, uh, a number of studies that, um, that their interpretation of Islam through the Muslim Brotherhood, through Said Qutb, is an interpretation of Islam that has been heavily influenced by the encounter with Heidegger and uh, and German uh, high German thought, uh, 20th century philosophy, and French existentialism. We see in uh, the jihadists a revulsion at all things modern, a determination to return to a pristine origin. In their case, the pristine origin, however, is not... Um, let's say, uh, pre-Socratic philosophy. Um, it's rather a certain era associated with um, their prophet Muhammad and a certain interpretation of it. Um, but the question of what drives uh, uh, the jihadists is one question. The question of what, um, what impels Americans, uh, Europeans too, but what it impels American students and some American professors to uh, enthusiastically embrace mass murderers, uh, terrorists who, uh, who, who engage in group rape, who kill babies, who gun down young people uh, at dancing at a music festival in the desert, who burn whole families alive. Something has clearly gone profoundly wrong at our institutions of higher education when um, uh, 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 students and faculty embrace such monstrosity and when many, not all, but when many um, leaders, uh, administrative leaders in higher education cannot find the words to immediately denounce these expressions of what I would have thought many people would uh, reflexively and properly call evil. Yes, right. Um, thank you for that. So um, two interesting points. One, you mentioned uh, the effect of uh, modern philosophy, in particular Heidegger, on uh, uh, this famous Egyptian uh, imam thinker uh, that you referred to. Um, that's a theme of my book, right? So there's a tremendous amount of of subterranean uh, influence that modern philosophy has had on our politics that I think ordinary people are not necessarily aware of, which is one of the reasons I wrote the book. Um, so I'd be interested if you could say a little bit uh, more about that. Uh, and then the question of of the 
very disturbing reaction, uh, as you say, in America and on, on the university campuses. Uh, this touches also on, uh, I, I've been, you know, I'm hardly the first to talk about wokeism as a kind of a religion, but my theory, the theory I lay out, is that uh, um, the existential angst uh, that you find among people who are radical uh, atheists and secularists is very hard to sustain. And so there's a kind of, uh, they, they require some kind of substitute for the human need for spirituality. <laughs> and unfortunately, it manifests itself sometimes in rather unpleasant ways. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> so I wonder if you'd uh, say a little bit more about this the connection between Heidegger and uh, Islamic Jihad, which I think is surprising to many people. And then this question of this very ugly form of uh, quasi-religious tribalism that we're seeing on, on, on the left and especially on the campuses. Well, first, um, you're, you're quite right to see that in uh, both the points I was trying to make, there's a deep connection to to the arguments of your book. I want to take this uh, opportunity to, to congratulate you on the book. As I said before we went live, um, you, you've managed um, two great accomplishments. One, to, dis, to, uh, um, to richly discuss crucial themes and to do it in a short book. Um, we, we do have to take, uh, take seriously the realities of modern life, the realities of modern life, or at least 21st century life. Uh, one of them is that people don't have a lot of time to read. So to create something to compose something so rich in such short a space is terrific. Well done. Um, and and second, um, uh, one of the uh, overarching themes of your book, um, as you as you emphasize, a theme that you learned about, uh, especially through Harry Jaffa and Jaffa uh, through the um, remarkable Leo Strauss, is that um, underlying um, many of our political uh, discontents are. Um, our decisions that have been made, our choices connected to modern political philosophy, and I would say uh, m mistakes about what are, uh, about the best in modern political philosophy, deviations, radicalizations, transformations of positions into uh, ideologies. So that's in general. I'll go back to uh, to the two points with which I began. Um, yes, I think Heidegger's influence. Uh, has been, uh, I think, philosophically and morally harmful in a variety of ways. Um, uh, one of those ways was to encourage a contempt for all modern, modern achievements. Um, yes, yeah, some some characteristic problems with which many of us uh, can can agree. Um, uh, too much, we might worry. Um, too much uncontrolled uh, technology, uh, lack of concern, some lack of concern for uh, for, for the environment, um, irrationality. But Heidegger encourages a wholesale denunciation and repudiation of the modern world. Um, this seems to me uh, philosophically, practically unsound. This has been braced by the jihadists. Um, on the side of the uh, the American uh, Hamas apologists, um, we we also see a um, uh, derived from modern philosophy, or at least uh, recent strands of it that all owe something to uh, Heidegger students like Foucault, discussed prominently in your book. Um, another expression of um, uh, more than discontent scorn for much of what's modern, a reduction of what's modern to a kind of, um, as you know, a kind of prison house in which uh, we have no access to a truth other than that which is um, produced through power. And all, as you, as you write, uh, you quote Foucault, all exercises of, uh, we can't exercise power with also, without also producing truth. This is, uh, I hope we can go into this in more detail, but this is a fancy French formulation of the, of, uh, of the idea of relativism, or that um, all expressions, all opinions about morality and politics, all practices are themselves expressions of the desire for, uh, for power. Um, 
th this encourages a uh, impatience which leads into contempt for students and faculty members toward the United States of America, toward the institutions of limited government, for respect for individual freedom, for um, for the belief that there is a uh, a history that can be told that is, however imperfect, approaches accuracy and uh, and truth about the American um, about the American uh, experiment in ordered liberty. And of course, um, and as uh, you point out in your book, when you uh, when you discuss the paradoxes of um, of the modern left. This relativism is actually accompanied with a dogmatism that uh, uh, simultaneously proclaims to know the real truth about uh, the American political tradition. And the real truth happens to be racism all the way down, or as we say today, systemic uh, systemic racism. So some of the, some of these confusions, I believe, um, and uh, and the passions that are aroused by these confusions help explain why uh, why uh, a substantial number of American students at the best universities and some of their professors um, uh, immediately embraced the moral monsters of uh, of Hamas jihad. Yeah, yeah. Um, you've touched on it already, but so one of the themes that I elaborate and and uh which people seem to find somewhat interesting from, from the feedback I've received, is uh, there is this incoherence, this tension. Strauss, as you know, famously said uh, in his essay on relativism that it doesn't really last very long. It, it sounds nice, um, but it ends up rather quickly becoming what he calls a seminary of intolerance. Uh, uh, people need to believe in something. And I touch on this, uh, you know, what I think is a deep psychic need uh, to believe, to belong, to be part of what I call a holy city, uh, a closed community. Uh, uh, and so on the one hand, uh, we have that. On the other hand, we're also still very much enthralled to certain slogans and bumper stickers about the Enlightenment. So uh, part of the left and part of, uh, you might say, the ruling class in America is a devotion to science and scientific expertise. Uh, and we saw that come out, you know, pretty prominently in COVID. Uh, and and the American people are asked uh, to substantially defer to the authority of scientific experts who have superior knowledge and training. And this comes out of Hegel, right? The idea that that the ruling class will have uh, superior education, scientific insight, uh, and in a way, you can almost dispense with consent because. All the basic problems have been solved by history. <laughs> We're at the end of history. What remains are administrative details, and it's the administrative experts, properly trained, who can draw on scientific disciplines. And on the other hand, we have uh, uh, the postmodernism, the quasi nihilism, the tribalism, the identity politics, the racial politics, uh, uh, the anti rationalism, which dominates in the academy, but is being spread now through DEI and other things into. The corporate world and the military. I'm curious. I don't really resolve in my book where this is going to go. I see it as a tension, um, and I see it as a problem for the left politically. Um, but I'm curious. Do you do you agree with that? Do you think this is going to be a real problem? Do you have any thoughts on on how the left is ever, or if they can resolve this uh, philosophical uh, contradiction? Um, well, but before I engage in uh, prediction. And as we 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 both can recall, as Yogi Berra said, prediction is difficult, especially of the future. Um, I do want to emphasize how right I think you are, um, and how valuable I think it was for you to have identified early on in your book this tension within modern philosophy, which has been, um, to use a mar to use a Marxist language, heightened in the recent decades between. Um, the scientism and the relativism, between scientism and relativism. How deep does this go? We we see it already quite explicitly in one of the authors you mentioned, uh, uh, Thomas Hobbes. In Leviathan, early on, uh, Hobbes tells us that, um, that the world is matter in motion and nothing more. Matter in motion and nothing more. That means that if we want to understand things, we need to become Newtonian scientists. 
He also tells us in chapter six um, that appetite that uh, good and evil are names for particular appetites and ver- aversions. In other words, good is what we have an appetite for. Aversion is what we dislike or find agreeable. Uh, but as Hobbes uh, indicates, appetites and aversions um, uh, differ among people, and there's no rational way of ranking them. So this is a form, an early modern form of um, uh, of relativism. Those two notions coexist in Hobbes. But here's a complexity. Um, Hobbes is not actually a mathematician, as some of us also learned from uh, Leo Strauss uh, in one of his early books on on Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes' moral and political teaching owes a lot more to Thucydides uh, than it does to either of those propositions. Um, Hobbes is, uh, in fact, and Hobbes himself says that in chapter 13 of Leviathan, that the state of nature is an inference made from the passions. And he tells us in the introduction of Leviathan that we learn about the passions by consulting what's within us and comparing them to our observations about uh, others. So um, much of the greatness of Hobbes's uh, moral and political theory uh, actually departs from the scientism and the relativism. But the scientism and the relativism grow in significance with uh, let's call them uh, among friends, the the subsequent waves of modernity uh, about which Leo Strauss wrote and which you nicely summarize in uh, uh, in your book. Whereas the um, uh, the core moral and political teaching in Hobbes is uh, is neglected. And we could say something similar, uh, and I want to get back to this, as Strauss himself does about um, about Locke and other, uh, and Hume and other uh, other English uh, uh, other English writers, but now I'm uh, I'm I'm I don't want to muddy the central point, which is um, that today we live in a world in which uh, uh, um, the moderation, the actual moderation and prudence of the English political theorists has been lost, and uh, the radical radical premises um, have been embraced. Um, and we are we are living amidst their uh, their radicalization, and so uh, I, I I will um, actually for a moment decline to predict what's going to become of the left. But I will say that I think that um, it's incumbent upon us to actually do what um, what is implied uh, at the conclusion of uh, a lecture, famous lecture by Leo Strauss, which you cite on German nihilism. It's incumbent upon us to um, recover modern ideals, but re- recover modern ideals as interpreted uh, through the moderation and prudence of English of the English authors of them, especially uh, especially Locke and Hume. More to say on that, but I'm going to stop there for the moment. Uh, moderation is uh, always appropriate. Uh, we, we, you and I had a very friendly <laughs> colloquy about moderation and extremism. And I think we were, uh, uh, what's that joke about Americans and English, two people separated by a common <laughs> language. I think, I think we were, we were on the same page. We were just agree, emphasizing yeah. different points. Uh, uh, it all, I think, as you rightly noted, the very definitions of extremism and moderation depend on the circumstance and prudence is always the right thing to do in the right circumstance. And so yeah. what might, what might seem extreme might in fact be moderate depending. Right. And so this, comes up especially in war as we're seeing today. Um, not to jump ahead, uh, uh, and we can sort of come around to some other things, but since you mentioned uh, uh, moderation and the solution, how this is all going to go, I end the book um, firmly rejecting despair for, for mm. a variety of reasons. But on the other hand, I do think there is real cause for concern. Uh, both sides of uh, the dominant left-wing uh, ruling elements of society, which I think almost everyone agrees is very much in control of the government bureaucracy, of the academy, popular culture, the universities. Both wings of this tension that I point to, the scientism and the relativism as you describe it, both are, are really not compatible with constitutional self-government. 
and neither are really compatible with the idea of uh, prudent public deliberation, uh, right? Uh, Self-government means arguing about justice. That means we have to have common terms <laughs> about what justice means. And it seems that um, both polls, the Hegelian poll and the Nietzschean poll, uh, are not open to uh, rational discussion about the nature of justice. And therefore, um, it's hard to see how to get them back <laughs> into a form and an understanding of citizenship uh, that can get the country back on track. Uh, yes. I don't want to sort of put you on the spot, but <laughs> I mean, what, do, what do you think about that? That's okay. Well, um, the, the short answer is um, we need to engage in at least two acts of recovery, recovery of the political theory of the founding and recover, uh, recovery of classical political philosophy, to which your book is, um, uh, I, I would say, a kind of introduction and, and invitation. Um, I'm all in favor of that. Of course, you, you will immediately reply, um, uh, easier said than done. <laughs> Uh, and and I agree with this. So let's begin with this observation. Um, so scientism, the scientism we see, and the uh, relativism we see, and the we've also agreed we need a third term, the dogmatism we see. Here it gets complicated because the relativism we see is a form of do dogmatism. The scientism we see, scientism here meaning that um, Morality and politics too are best understood through uh, science, through the through the lens of natural science. Relativism is dogmatic because it treats as unquestionably true the relative relativity of all values. But that's now accompanied in 21st century Amer America on the left with um, an invincible dogmatic certitude about what is actually right and wrong. Now you could say that's incoherent. But it turns out, and we've long known it, human beings are capable of holding um, incoherent uh, notions in uh, in their heads and uh, and in their souls. So, what do we, how to respond to this? Again, easier said than done. The revival of uh, of a true liberal education. But let's uh, let's begin with this observation. Scientism is a radicalization of something that, uh, as far as we can tell, is true. Natural science provides powerful, powerful tools for understanding and, yes, controlling, not completely, but controlling the natural world. Uh, and that's a benefit to human beings. And there's even a, there's actually a biblical basis, not just a basis in uh, Bacon uh, and Locke for that. Um, moral relativism is a kind of um, at least a, the best uh, a case for how it developed, the best case, is it's a radicalization of teachings about toleration. Um, it goes too far. It undermines them. It does not understand toleration with the moderation and prudence with that uh, John Locke showed when he was explaining it, a letter concerning toleration. Um, and <laughs> the dogmatic belief that uh, in um, the one true account of America, on, on the on the hard left, namely that America was uh, um, conceived in slavery and remains dedicated to slavery and therefore has to be overturned. This is actually a radicalization of uh, of a sound assumption that there is a truth out there for us to um, uh, grasp. There is a right and wrong, and we should be on the correct side of right, and we should be against, we should be against wrong. So there actually um, is a, a basis to begin a still a basis to begin a conversation. I don't for a moment um, uh, minimize the challenges, and I will note that you make a case against. Excuse me, you make a case against despair, but not a case for optimism. <laughs> These are different, and I'm with you in the way you uh, you put it. It is um, it would be uh, I think unconscionable to uh, um, to to cease and desist in defense of um, of uh, cease and desist from the defense of uh, the American founding, well understood, and to cease and desist. From the defense of um, classical political philosophy, well understood. 
Right. So uh, since you brought up classical political philosophy, I don't get an opportunity to outside of my immediate circle of friends at the Claremont Institute, most of whom all studied, you know, with the same people in the same place. Uh, I don't get an opportunity to speak to too many uh, intelligent Straussians from a slightly different perspective. And so I want to push a little bit on the theory and, you know, this will not necessarily appeal to every potential viewer, but the more academic ones, I think, will appreciate this. Uh, it's not entirely clear always what Strauss's project was, right? He thought, he, he spoke often of the crisis of the West, but how he understood that and what he meant by going back to the problem of Socrates, uh, I think is an interesting and an open question. And I talk a little bit in the book in, in a slightly provocative way, you know, I talk Me. about Socratic imperialism <laughs> and the Platonic project, uh, which has, which is at the root of modernity. Uh, I, I I wonder, you know, that the, there are simplistic critics of Strauss who see him as just an enemy of modernity and the Enlightenment, and I think that's a little too simple. On the other hand, you know, in his exchanges with Kojev and his remark that the world homogenous state would be the end of philosophy on Earth, uh, you know, the loss of nomos. So, you know, in, in a way, this is a, this is a more theoretical way of responding to what you're saying on this question of optimism and and, and pessimism. Uh, nomos is, you know, uh, the authoritative opinions, the mythoi, uh, the nomoi are not things that political philosophy can just conjure. They have to be organic in some way. And while I agree with you that Heidegger had many problems, uh, his critique of technology is very trenchant. And this phrase that he has about only new gods can save us now is, I think, um, pregnant with meaning. And it was pregnant with meaning for Strauss. It's not entirely clear when the whole intellectual modern Western world uh, believes in a philosophized politics, right, in the absolute power of reason, and is no longer open to the idea of divinity, is no longer open to the idea that the laws derive their authority from the gods. Uh, how you get back to a form of natural politics, the kind of natural politics uh, 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 of the ancient world, right? Um, sorry, that's sort of a convoluted yeah. question, but do you know what I'm getting at? I, I do. It's a big question. I've read your book, so I, I have a good sense of what you're uh, getting at. Um, if you allow me to begin with um, an uh, autobiographical remark or two. Um, uh, uh, I am, uh, I think, unusual among those uh, those today who who admire Leo Strauss, those who regard Strauss as an indispensable teacher about the history of uh, political philosophy, an indispensable uh, teacher for understanding uh, the political challenges we face today. Unusual uh, in that um, I, I didn't discover Leo Strauss through uh, through a teacher. Um, I discovered him by accident when I was uh, um, wandering around in the um, on the fifth floor, the top floor of the uh, library as a graduate student at Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I was taking a class uh, in Hebrew on uh, Bikor Tadat, the critique of religion. My Hebrew wasn't very good. I was in the English language section and looking for a book that might help me. And I uh, stumbled upon a book uh, called uh, Spinoza's critique of religion. Spinoza was one of the figures that we were uh, studying in class. And I thought um, this book could be valuable. It helped me with three or four weeks of the class. I opened to the table of contents um, and I found that the author, uh, I hadn't even noted yet, I was so excited to have such a such a book, I noticed that uh, the author deals with Spinoza, uh, Spinoza's precursors, Lucretius, Calvin, Hobbes, and uh, and I thought to myself, wow, so does my course. This book is going to get me through a lot of uh, the course. And then uh, I turned to the preface, to uh, off-putting tiny print. I'm on the fifth floor of the uh, Hebrew University uh, library, overlooking the old city of Jerusalem at sunset. Very beautiful. Um, and I read a line that goes something like, um, uh, this study um, was written by a young Jew in Weimar, Germany, who found himself in the grips of a theological, of a theological political dilemma. 
something like that. And my immediate reaction was, um, I don't exactly know what the theological political dilemma is. And I'm not in Weimar, I'm in Jerusalem, but I think I'm in the grips of it too. And I spent a good deal of the next year um, reading every uh, book I could get my hands on in Jerusalem in those days. Uh, there was a limited number. Uh, every book I could get on by the author of Spinoza's Critique of Religion, a man named Leo Strauss. So one, that's how I uh, that's how I discovered uh, Leo Strauss. Um, now, on the question of uh, Strauss, your treatment, the problems of uh, modern philosophy and class and its relation to classical philosophy. So uh, another autobiographical comment. Um, uh, I'm one of those who uh, actually learned to appreciate the achievements of modern philosophy from reading Leo Strauss. Now, um, that's not what one typically hears, because typically one hears uh, one knows that Leo Strauss is a great critic of uh, of the modern turn that Leo Strauss, which is true. Uh, that Leo Strauss had uh, recovered the serious study of classical political philosophy. True, Leo Strauss is um, uh, uh, conservative, true of, of sorts. How did I learn to appreciate modern philosophy from uh, Leo Strauss? Well, first, uh, I had previously read um, radical authors like, uh, like Alistair McIntyre, who taught me that my only choice, and I learned a lot from McIntyre, was Nietzsche or Aristotle. But initially I learned from Leo Strauss that um, uh, facing the, uh, the reasonable options available to one in 20th century, and still 21st century, uh, in the 21st century world, the only option a reasonable uh, man or woman would choose is liberal democracy. And uh, on further reflection, I regarded uh, uh, the greatest of the liberal democracies to be the American experiment in ordered liberty, of which I was already a citizen. So, uh, so it seemed to me that uh, my job was to contribute to um, understanding it, conserving it, and in and in uh, improving it. Now, I I also think that this is um, this is consistent with Leo Strauss's. Uh, teaching, as I understand it, you um, you summarize some of the longstanding debates about uh, about Strauss's teaching. Let me just make uh, this observation and then uh, we'll follow your lead with, with questions pursuing this thought. Um, um, I think that um, I uh, I think those uh, who believe the non-Straussians like Shadja Drury and the Straussians that uh, Leo Strauss is a teacher of nihilism are wrong. And uh, I've never been able actually to identify the basis in Leo Strauss's writings for thinking of that, thinking that the best I can do is that uh, Shadja Drury is more honest about it. Uh, she's more honest in her dishonesty, meaning, uh, well, I, I don't want to accuse any Straussians of that, but she is uh in a way, she she displays her dishonesty by quoting a, uh, one of Leo Strauss's summaries of an opinion by Nietzsche or an opinion by uh, Machiavelli, and then attributing that opinion to Leo Strauss. Um, uh, I learned from Leo Strauss to appreciate um, uh, Socrates and Plato as zetetic thinkers, as skeptical thinkers in the classical sense meaning they put hard questions. Put aside for a moment the political implications of that and how it's done. They put hard questions, um, questions that make you think, questions that uh, enable you to understand the um, uh, sometimes incoherent, other times fragile uh, foundations of some of our most cherished opinions. Um, but I think actually Strauss would have in this, um, agreed with this observation that Nietzsche makes in Beyond Good and Evil. Early in Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche says, um, the notion of refutation is greatly overrated in philosophical circles. What, what, what does that mean? Well, I'll give you an example. 
uh, it's really one of Strauss's examples from um, uh, from his reading of the Plato of, of uh, the Republic in City and Man. Um, he shows in uh, in that essay in his uh, in his exploration of Book One how um, how it uh, you don't understand Book One if you merely see Socrates refuting Cephalus, Polemarchus, um, uh, Thrasymachus. What you have to understand is how, how Socrates shows the limitations of these opinions and shows how elements of those opinions are preserved in subsequent, uh, subsequent analysis, preserved, uh, refined, constrained, but, but preserved. So it's uh, not enough to say those opinions are, uh, are wrong. It's to say that they're not the full truth and therefore um, uh, create, create um, falsehood when uttered by, by those particular uh, thinkers. So in any case, um, uh, I, I also think, and uh, sometimes one sees this strand uh, actually in your analysis. I actually think there's a tension in your analysis um, between um, sometimes you suggest, um, or at least you report Strauss's view, that Machiavelli represents a uh, a fundamental break with classical political philosophy. That seems to be Machiavelli's view of things, um, even as their continuities, but a fundamental break. And other times, um, you seem to suggest, uh, I don't know whether you ascribe this to Strauss, a view that I associate with, um, with Nietzsche and Heidegger. Are problems derived from Plato? So, uh, so, I don't accept that view that our problems derive from Plato. I, uh, since I, I see, I see Plato as, um, uh, as among other things, articulating tensions, puzzles, fundamental problems that arise within political, uh, that arise within political life. Um, these tensions are not Plato's fault. He brings them. He brings them into uh, focus. What we have in the twentieth and twenty first century are um, uh, the freezing uh, of the idea of rationality, the exaggeration of the idea of rationality. Um, this is not. Uh, I, I don't think this is. Um, this is Plato's Plato's fault, indeed, uh, as I've already suggested, um, and as you suggest too. Um, it's a, a return to Plato, a return to Aristotle, a return to uh, founding ideas, and I, I share um, I, I share uh, um, at least that part of Harry Jaffa's thinking that you quote in your book about um, about how we ought to understand the American founding um, as modern in one sense. Um, uh, founding political life on low and solid ground, a political commitment to securing comfortable self-preservation. But as Jaffa immediately says, the purpose for an America of uh, limiting politics to comfortable self-preservation is to leave room for um, individuals in their, with their friends, in their families, in their communities, to pursue the highest of which human beings are capable. So, um, so, so I don't see our modern, um, our contemporary trials and tribulations, as some do, as an expression of uh, Plato or um, or liberal mo modernity. I see our uh, trials and tribulations as a departure from the wisdom of both. Fair enough. Fair enough. I completely agree with you. By the way, that uh, liberal democracy is the most decent plausible regime in the modern world. We live in the modern world. There's a little joke in Claremont about a certain sect of Straussians who have what we call polis envy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Can we all go back to Athens, right? Martin, you know, Martin Diamond's joke from the 70s, right? You know, Remind me. So Socrates studied the opinions of the Athenians. And if you two want to study the opinions of the Athenians, go to St. John's. <laughs> want to study the opinions of the Americans, come to Claremont. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's, um, good, that's good advice. Although you could um you could take your uh, BA at St. John's and then graduate and go off to Claremont. <laughs> right. <laughs> move move from Athens to the modern world. Yes. Uh all of that's true. And you know, you're right. And Jaffa 
uh, emphasized that the you know uh, America was partly you know there's different ways of phrasing this and people sometimes get their uh, uh, get wrapped around the axle about the right way to phrase this. You could say partly classical, partly modern, or consistent with you know. Jaffa was sometimes accused of creating this chimerical being, Lockistotle, <laughs> right, in which he uh, yeah. assimilated Locke and Aristotle. Although I think you know it's a plausible argument that if Locke was living, I mean, if Aristotle was living in new historical political conditions, his own teaching about prudence would advise him to mo modify how how uh, natural right becomes political right. Having said all that, um, you know, and I think here Tom West is very good. He shows that the American experiment is still, um, although he very much emphasizes that it's modern, I think he does still show that it it isn't and can't be uh, cosmopolitan in, in any simple way, right? I mean, one way I've decided to start talking about this is the experiment doesn't scale infinitely, right? And so when you have a country that is essentially now uh, has no borders, is open to literally uh, uh, every kind of person without even, I mean, without even paying attention to habits and character and disposition and all these things that the founders thought were essential to self-government, uh, then it's not so clear that the experiment still works because then you no longer have politics in a way, right? I mean, politics depends on an archae. It depends on citizens sharing a, a sense of the noble and the just. And when that goes, then you don't really have a political community anymore. And so maybe that's an, an answer to why I, I don't despair, but I, I'm not an optimist, because it's not so clear to me how to fix that problem. Um, it's not so clear to me how to fix it either, uh, but I want to go back uh, and, uh, and, and, and further uh, refine the formulation of the problem. Uh, but even as I do that, I hear echoing in my head a colleague of mine in uh, in the State Department. He was the uh, uh, Assistant Secretary for East Asia and the Pacific. He covered China. And he was a, um, uh, a former fighter pilot, a general from the, uh, uh, in the Air Force. And uh, I was in the policy planning staff as director of policy planning. And he like to come down to my office and say, uh, oh, you guys in policy planning, you spend all your time admiring the problem. And we spend our time, you know, with lines of effort and dealing with it. So um, I'm I'm alert to that. Now I'm not e now I'm not even in the State Department. Now we're uh, students of these matters. And I, I rec but did you say I recognize the danger of only admiring the problem? We'll talk about practical matters. Um, uh, but a uh, a couple observations about um, uh, about Jaffa, how to understand the American uh, founding, the relationship between Locke and Aristotle. Um, first off, um, I like a formulation that um, uh, has been attributed to, I've attributed to my former colleague, uh, Harvey Mansfield. Uh, according to the legend, um, one day, last day of class, a year-long uh, sequence on ancient medieval in the fall and modern political philosophy in the spring, a precocious student, uh, Mansfield likes precocious students, raised his hand and said, uh, well, Professor Mansfield, all year long, you've been teaching us one political philosopher after another, all with great enthusiasm, but we, we'd like to know, who's your favorite? Whom do you follow? Uh, and Mansfield smiled. He liked the uh, precociousness. And then he said uh, in his pithy and provocative and illuminating way, Locke in the short run, Aristotle in the long run. <laughs> now, now that's slightly different than um, what is sometimes attributed to Jaffa. It doesn't say that um, Locke was an Aristotelian. It says that Aristotle, who after all was a student of a variety, the variety of regimes, and Aristotle, who in his own day taught us, um, taught us that in his own day, he embraced a mixed and imperfect regime, polity, a mixture of oligarchy and democracy. Um, Matthew's comments suggest that Aristotle would, um, an Aristotelian, one who had learned from Aristotle would in, uh, embrace 
liberal democracy today as uh, as the best that's practically attainable in the circumstances of modernity. And now I second, I believe consistent with that, is an observation that Strauss makes in a uh, in the speech German nihilism, which you uh, draw on in uh, in your book. This is consistent with a remark he makes about uh, Churchill, but it goes beyond it. Um, in this, in, to, in the at the end of the uh, speech, at the the lecture he gave, this is from 1941. Um, while Hitler was in power and rampaging, uh, Strauss, as, as you point out, explains that uh, German nihilism is not simply nihilism. There was a, um, it's utterly deplorable, but it had a modern impulse. The modern impulse was a, uh, the, a moral impulse. The moral impulse was a, 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 a rejection of modern ideals, especially um, uh, a comprehensive focus with, let's say again, uh, comfortable self-preservation. Strauss goes on to say that uh, to understand that this German sensibility, which de deteriorated into the horrors of uh, Nazism, it's he says it's useful to understand a remark of Nietzsche's. The remark of Nietzsche's is section from section 252 of Beyond Good and Evil, and uh, Nietzsche, uh, in which Nietzsche says. Um, uh, Hume and Locke uh, are responsible for the debasement and degradation of the very concept of the philosopher. By the way, that's interesting because uh, we, we learn from that what's often forgotten is that Nietzsche had a classical conception of what the philosopher is. Uh, but second, uh, Nietzsche despised Locke. Um, I wish more of my uh, common good conservative and national conservative friends who have taken to despising Locke would um, appreciate that they're taking Nietzsche's side in, <laughs> uh, in this matter. But Strauss, uh, who greatly admired Nietzsche, uh, goes on to criticize Nietzsche's view, uh, and even uh, you know a thousand times more that of the German nihilists. He says that the uh, uh, that. Uh, notwithstanding the flaws of the uh, the modern deals, modern ideals which are um, uh, which were originally English ideals, the English interpreted these modern ideals with characteristic English uh, moderation, improvement, and, and moderation and prudence, such that these ideals came to represent. This was Strauss's view. A uh, I've got I paraphrase but closely, a reasonable ad adaptation of the old and eternal ideal of decency, of rule of law, and of liberty that is not licensed under in changed uh, circumstances. Um, so that, and one can find versions of this uh, elsewhere in Strauss's uh, um, writings. So uh, I take our um, our uh, fundamental political task to be um, preserving these modern ideals and uh, the met and their instantiation, we Americans uh, in the United States. Okay, um, but uh, we say, what about the grave problems which you uh, which you describe in the beginning of your book? And we've touched on them uh, somewhat. Um, mostly. Uh, I agree um, with you. You describe the problems. We, we've already um, there are two aspects of it. One is the increasing incoherence of these two bad ideas: scientism and moral relativism. Um, but a second we haven't really uh, touched upon, I think, so far, is the problem of, and this is where uh, Foucault comes in for you: manipulation. Um, one, we are. Uh, at every turn, we are manipulated, especially by, um, a, a, I think your term, a progressive uh, oligarchy. But I can I can accept that a progressive oligarchy, um, uh, infusing public debate with uh, falsehood, even as they uh, attack disinformation, misinformation. Uh, and so on, of course, where what they call misinformation, disinformation is almost invariably 
any claim that departs from the uh, hard progressive uh, narrative. And you suggest, uh, with the help of Foucault, um, that this represents a new situation. But um, in your uh, um, dialectical integrity, you also um, wonder whether that's really so, because you recall that um, you recall your own discussion of the closed society, coupled w uh, which is based upon convention, which is based upon uh, opinion. You recall um, uh, and you present us with uh, a brief discussion of Plato's analogy of, uh, of the cave, which teaches that um, we always have been fundamentally manipulated when you get right down to it. And if that's so, um, how is our situation today uh, any different? So it's theoretically not different. You could say, well, um, the current manipulations are destructive of things, um, things great and noble. That seems to me to be uh, right. This particular form of m manipulation tries to um, sometimes deliberately, sometimes unwitted, unwittingly, uh, extinguish the very idea of an ascent uh, above the cave. Um, Strauss put it, as you know, uh, and I think um, for my money, uh, superior to Foucault, in the uh, uh, said that uh, we we moderns. This was already true in the 19th century, in the uh, 20th century. We, we we don't live in the natural cave. We live in in opinion, it's natural for us to be manipulated uh, in politics. We live below that natural cave. We need to re, re recover. We need to ascend one level up to the natural cave. Um, so I think about all, all of this, and uh, and it seems to me that uh, w once again, um, everything comes down to education. Again, but by that I don't say, you see how easy it is? We don't have to worry about all these other spheres, just education. No, no, no. That, that's another way of stating um, how, uh, how grave and complex the challenge is because the educational system, much of the educational system, K through 12, like the universities, is actually given over to the production and the reproduction of these destructive notions and ideas. So I promised I'd say something about practical matters. Um, I, I myself have now for more than a decade, um, as I know you uh, you have been, um, been involved in, and the Claremont Institute is an example of um, educational endeavors outside the, um, uh, the mainstream uh, academy, uh, outside of, um, uh, the elite universities and, and the state universities um, uh, through, through writings are a small part, but through the creation of summer programs, the creation of programs uh, year round, which are designed to introduce students to um, uh, to America, to uh, Western civilization, which as Strauss um, uh, emphasizes has uh, um, two indispensable roots, classical political philosophy and the, uh, uh, I will speak of both of them as traditions, the traditions of biblical faith and the traditions of classical uh, philosophy. So, um, uh, so while there's a lot of work to do, and as you mentioned, I was in the State Department dealing with um, urgent practical matters, for example, having to do with um, uh, the need for the United States to prevail in the uh, contest that, uh, that China has imposed upon us. Um, I think actually even prevailing ultimately at that level is going to uh, um, turn uh, on as much as anything else, um, reform of our educational system. Uh, working outside the educational system still means just a small number of uh, students, but um, you have to start somewhere, and that's where we've started. And uh, I, and I hope we um, our our students will carry the uh, the struggle forward. Fair enough. Fair enough. 
Uh, I see we're already at an hour. I have one more question for you. Uh, I don't say too much about foreign policy in the book, and that's really, in a way, one of your specialties. Uh, you may know, and some of the, uh, the people watching may know the name John Marini, uh, who's an old friend of Claremont and has written very perceptively for a long time on the administrative state. Uh, and he's also concerned about uh, what's going on. And he points out, you know, as as uh, angry and destructive and powerful and regressive as the woke oligarchy or whatever we're calling them may be, there's also quite a bit of frivolity. And it also depends uh, to, to a substantial degree on the United States still being a relatively prosperous and peaceful and secure country. Uh, you know, we can afford to ignore uh the great blessings of constitutionalism that we inherited and spurn those uh, as long as we're safe and secure and comfortable. But if there's some kind of crisis, uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know about a virus, but certainly some sort of international crisis, because there are other countries in the world who are less frivolous <laughs> and much more serious than the United States. And that may force uh, all of us, and especially uh, the ideological left, back to reality in a way. Now, it seems, and I certainly don't want to phrase it this way, odd to wish for a crisis, but I wonder if it might have to come down to that uh, to bring us all back to what Strauss called the basic experiences of right and wrong, uh, which we've we pretended to ignore for some time. Yes, well, um, I, I, uh, I hope it does not come down to that for reasons discussed uh, in your in your book. Um, uh, one, two words, Tony Fauci. <laughs> in other words, um, it's true that in response to crisis, we could find ourselves uh, returning to the fundamentals. Uh, in other words, that the response to crisis could bring out the best in us. It could also bring out the worst in us. Uh, COVID brought out some, um, uh, some tendencies toward tyranny that are deeply embedded within um, uh, within the progressive spirit. And I, uh, I have to say that uh, I don't think that, um, I think that uh, President Trump um, should have done much more to rein in uh, Fauci. He should have been um, more faithful to the teachings of federalism and seen that uh, uh, what, what is needed, certainly after two or three months, um, after, after the, um, the initial impact that what was needed was to allow the 50 states to experiment with approaches to uh, um, to COVID, but but I do want to emphasize uh, this that um, um, w whatever the source will, would be of uh, retain returning to sobriety, uh, to reclaiming an appreciation, as Strauss said, of uh, I think a natural right in history of those simple experiences of right and wrong, which are at, at bottom uh, the basis of the. Uh, of the uh, of the belief among students of political philosophy that natural right is real and desirable, um, um, I, I think that um, to prevail to prevail against China, um, we need to get our we do need to get our house in order. China has been um, contesting American supremacy for decades. By which I mean, uh, China is a great power that not only seeks preeminence in its region, the Indo-Pacific, that not only seeks preeminence uh, ar around the world in the in the international order that the United St States helps bring into existence. China is a great power that seeks to transform world order, to put Beijing at the center, and to have and to uh, have that. Beijing-centered world order, much friendlier to authoritarianism. Uh, I think that would be a disaster for uh, the United States. I think it would be a disaster for um, uh, for lovers of uh, for lovers of freedom. Um, uh, I think it was no accident that uh, Mike Pompeo, uh, Secretary of State, uh, that uh, under whom I served, uh, not only made uh, the China challenge. His uh, an America central foreign policy concern. He understood all from all the other challenges through the lens of the China challenge because it's unfolding around the world. The same Secretary of State Mike Pompeo actually created a commission 
on unalienable rights. Um, the purpose of which was really twofold. Uh, one, to reclaim human the notion of human rights from its hijacking by the left, by its by um, the efforts to equate human rights with the progressive political agenda. But Pompeo, I believe, had a second motive. I, I was executive secretary of the C commission, worked with Marianne Glendon and others on it. But there was a second purpose. Uh, there was not only a uh, it was not only a response to the left; it was also a response to the right. I think Pompeo discerned that uh, too many people on the right accepted the left wing equation of human rights with a progressive political agenda. But Pompeo liked to recall that on his first day at West Point. He was handed a uh, a copy of the Federalist, and he still has his copy. And he knew, as a student of uh, the American Constitution, the American Declaration of Independence, that the great American experiment in liberty is based upon um, uh, unalienable rights, which are held to be self evident. And Pompeo knew that um, while there are probably important, there's there is significance to the language, uh, different languages, natural right, termino terminology, natural rights, unalienable rights, human rights. Um, something that an unalienable right meant is a right that you possess because you're a human being. Um, whatever the other differences, an unalienable right is a human right. So Mike Pompeo knew that, um, uh, that uh, human rights were part of the American political tradition and that we needed to recover them, the classical understanding of them, the 18th century understanding of them, to better understand um, what it meant to uh, incorporate a defense of human rights into a responsible U.S. Uh, foreign policy. So it turns out even there, to return to where we began, it turns out uh, questions of political philosophy uh, certainly in the Mike Pompeo State Department, were indissolubly connected to, indeed at the bottom of, um, the leading issues of foreign policy. Well, that's terrific. Uh, uh, I'm glad you're, you're actually sort of singing from the Claremont Institute songbook here when we say we don't. <laughs> We should not relinquish the, the the language and the principles of the founders to the left's misrepresentation. We need to claim that that uh, the art, the, the language, and the arguments about consent and equality properly understood and constitutionalism are the best grounds we have for 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 recovering republican self government. I'll just end with one word, since you mentioned human beings. Uh, what I liked about what you just said is is it points back to nature. You had referred earlier to the pit beneath the cave. We're living in a kind of ideological, artificial world. And that's, in a way, what Foucault is very useful for helping us understand. He lives in and points to and helps explain this artificial pit beneath the cave. And if we were to ever get back to the natural cave by recovering an understanding of uh, nature, we'd still have all the problems that Socrates talked about. We'd have the ordinary <laughs> problems of politics. Yes. But that would be a great achievement from where we are now if we could just get back <laughs> To the ordinary problems of the natural cave, but that means first recovering the idea of nature. And that's one of the things that I think all of us are interested in doing. So well uh, said. Peter, thank you so much. It's been a delightful, scintillating, provocative conversation. Uh, I'm very grateful for your time. Thank you for your questions and thank you for your book. <laughs> Thanks very much. Take care. <laughs>